So today we are going to go over the complement system. And the complement system is a series of about 30 proteins which are responsible for a nonspecific immune response. This pretty much means that these proteins will work together to kill any pathogen, virus, bacteria, you know, foreign, foreign bug that's in your body. It doesn't really care what type it is. It'll just seek and destroy. Now, the thing about the complement system is that it works on the principle of a cascade of chemical reactions, which pretty much means that one protein will do something or, or undergo some change, and that will have another change to another protein. And this long chain of protein changes occurs until finally, you could get something that'll kill a cell, or kill a bacteria, or kill a pathogen. So, you have three ways to activate the proteins, or get them ready to kill. They are the classic pathway, the alternative, and the lectin pathway. These will all be reviewed later on in separate parts of this video. There are also three ways to kill pathogens once the proteins are activated. There's the MAC, or membrane attack complex. There's the inflammatory, or in, um, response, which involves histamines and there's opsonization, which involves phagocytes and macrophages. All right, so we will first quickly move on to the classic alternative and lectin pathways. Activation of the complement system occurs on pathogen surfaces. This is the pathogen surface and the red dots are antigens. The C1 complex binds to the antibody and the binding results in the activation of the C1R and the C1S proteases. Active C1S cleaves C4 into C4A and C4B. C2 proenzyme binds to C4B and then is cleaved by the activated C1S. C2A and C4B become known as C3 convertase. C3 convertase binds with C3 and cleaves it into C3A and C3B. C2A, C4B, and C3B becomes known as C3 and C5 convertase. Many molecules of C3 can be cleaved by the C3, C5 convertase. The many C3B fragments on the surface of the bacteria induces phagocytosis. C3, C5 convertase also cleaves and activates C5. The large fragment, C5B, acts to initiate the formation of the membrane attack complex. C3 is in the plasma and it's continuously cleaved into C3B and C3A. And then once cleaved, it's unstable. And then this big fragment here, C3B, is attached to the cell surface by covalent bond. On the cell membrane, C3 binds with factor B. And then factor D comes in. and cleaves factor B. Into two fragments. So it's factor. So then that becomes B A and then this is B, B. And then factor D leaves. So then this new complex, C3, B, 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 
becomes known as C3 convertase. C3 convertase creates many more C3B molecules, thus amplifying the pathway. So these are the C3B molecules, and the C3 comes in, and this convertase breaks up C3 so that the C3 fragment attaches to the cell surface, and then C3A, which is this missing fragment here, leaves into the plasma. Once C3 is cleaved by the C3 convertase, which is this thing right here, um, it can either attach to the cell surface, as we've seen in the last slide, or, or it can attach, or C3B can attach the C3 convertase and create what is known as the C5 convertase. C5 convertase cleaves C5 into C5B and C5A, initiating the membrane attack complex. Alright, so the third and final way in which the complement system is activated is through a pathway known as the lectin pathway. And the lectin pathway starts with a molecule that is very similar to the C1 complex seen in the classical pathway. The MBL complex, or Manon binding lectin complex, is integral to the uh, functioning of the lectin pathway. You've got in a manon binding lectin complex a protein, a manon binding lectin, or an MBL for short, and four accessory proteins. These four accessory proteins will come into play later, but for now you have two MASP1s and two MASP2s attached to your MBL. The thing about pathogens is that they also they have carbohydrate markers on their surface, which are essentially just sugars that help identify it. The MBL complex binds to the sugars on the pathogen surface. The series of chemical reactions that occur after this binding of protein head to carbohydrate result in the transformation of the MASPs into an enzyme. This is where things get very similar to the classical pathway. What happens is the enzyme that's created ends up cleaving C4 and C2, which are two other proteins in the complement system, into C4B, C2B, C4A, C2A. As said before, the C4B and the C2B combine to create a C3 convertase, which, uh, which, which binds to the surface of the pathogen. Then, because it's a C3 convertase that we have here, C3 interacts with this enzyme and is cleaved into C3A and C3B. Now that we have our C3A and C3B, we can move forward into the second phase of the complement system, which is the actual ways in which this system of proteins combats pathogens, bacteria, viruses, things of that sort. And that is a brief summary of the lectin pathway. So the first method that the complement system uses to kill pathogens once it's been activated is the membrane attack complex, or the MAC. The membrane attack complex is essentially a circular structure of complement proteins that attaches to pathogens and punches a hole in them so that the extracellular fluid surrounding the pathogen rushes in and explodes it. Um, we'll get into more detail later, but before you can get to that membrane attack complex, you first need a, a protein C5, and, and C5 is a complement protein that Sarah just talked about. So the question is, how do we get C5, which will ultimately result in the membrane attack complex, or MAC? It all starts with the addition of two proteins to create another structure. You have C3 convertase and C3B. You can get the C3 convertase from any of the three pathways, the classical, alternative, or lectin pathway. The C3B is naturally cleaved by the C3 convertase. What will happen is this C3B will combine with the C3 convertase and, co and create a C5 convertase. In other words, you have the addition of two proteins to create another protein that now can cleave C5 into C5A and C5B. C5A will be used in the inflammatory response, which Andrew will talk about later. But C5B, as indicated by the big pointy yellow hand, is the key player in initiating the membrane attack complex. And now we move on to the actual complex. And now we move on to the formation of the membrane attack complex, or MAC. So, we have just finished cleaving C5 into C5A and C5B. What happens next is, in your interstitial fluid, 
C5B will, will combine with C6, C7, and C8. These are all other complement proteins that are floating around in your body system. And these four proteins will combine to then create this kind of subcomplex, kind of like a halfway step that ultimately leads to the formation of the membrane attack complex. Once these four proteins, C5B, C6, C7, and C8, come together and fuse into a larger protein, they begin attracting molecules of C9, um, about 10 to 16 of them. And what will happen is they will combine with this pre-made colorful complex we have here to create the MAC, which will kind of look like a cylinder, just a big cylindrical protein shape. And once we've had all these proteins combine and fuse and make the MAC, we are good to go and ready to start using it to eliminate pathogens in the body. Once the membrane attack complex has been assembled, it is ready to start non-specifically targeting foreign pathogens in the body. Like we said before, bacteria, viruses, you know, anything, anything that's not supposed to be there. Um, before we even get to how the MAC kills pathogens, we first need to address the chemical properties of the membrane attack complex. And it's actually pretty straightforward. The outside part of the MAC, this part that I'm highlighting right now, is hydrophobic which essentially means that it's water-fearing or not attracted to water. While the interior, the opening of the MAC, kind of the, the inner part of this tube, this protein tube, is hydrophilic, which means it loves water. The thing is, most cell membranes are actually also hydrophobic because they're lipid bilayers. This interesting property of the MAC allows it to kill um, various pathogens. All right, let's get to the step-by-step -step process of how this thing works. You've got the MAC, and what'll happen is it'll attach to our pathogen. We'll just call this a bacteria cell for now. It's bad because it's got bad eyebrows or evil eyebrows. Um, and the MAC will attach to the pathogen. The thing is, since the MAC is hydrophobic and the pathogen's cell membrane or lipid bilayer is also hydrophobic, these two fuse, and what'll happen is the MAC punches a hole in the pathogen. That's really cool, because now the interior of the MAC is water loving. So essentially what's happening is you've put a giant straw inside your pathogen and water is rushing in through that opening and making the pathogen swell and kind of get to a bursting point. Why is that possible? Well, that's because the solute concentration inside the pathogen is higher than the solute concentration in the extracellular fluid that the pathogen is floating in, in your interstitial fluid, your lymph, you know, uh, you know your, your body fluids. And the thing is water osmosis from areas of high, from low solute concentration to high solute concentration, it will, it will rush to dilute um, a solution. In this case, water rushes in or extracellular fluid rushes in, fills up the cell or the pathogen to a, pathogen to a bursting point and the cell bursts and dies in a process called cytolysis. And that is how the membrane attack complex, or MAC, does its job. So from what James and Sarah have told us, we know that complement protein C3 splits into two parts, a smaller portion, C3A, and a larger portion, C3B. C3A splits off and joins up with complement protein C5A to induce the inflammatory response. The larger portion, C3B, travels towards pathogens and binds to their surface in a process known as opsonization, which we'll discuss later. But first, we need to talk about the inflammatory response. Now, if you remember our two complement proteins, C3A and C5A, they travel through your interstitial fluid until they come into contact with mast cells, which are essentially transporting vehicles for immune response chemicals. Once C3A and C5A come into contact with mast cells, they bind to the surface of them and cause them to release large amounts of histamines, which cause your blood vessels to become much more permeable, like this.
histamines also increase blood flow to the area of injury. This, coupled with your newly permeable blood vessels and the addition of phagocytes, which we'll discuss later, makes the area inflamed, which is why this is called the inflammatory response. The reason for making your blood vessels more permeable is to allow phagocytes to escape through the holes and head towards the pathogens to consume them. Involved in this process is an adhesion molecule called selectin, but we're not going to cover that today. The reason phagocytes know what direction to head is because complement protein C5A has a secondary purpose. It is known as a chemotaxin, which is basically a fancy way of saying that it sits at the site of inflammation and flags down the phagocytes to come and eat the pathogens. At this point, a complement protein that we discussed before, C3B, approaches the pathogens and binds to their surface in a process called opsonization. This promotes the process of phagocytosis because phagocytes also have a binding site on C3B on their surface. Opsonization is best demonstrated by this picture. This picture demonstrates the process of opsonization and then the process of phagocytosis. Opsonization begins when the body recognizes a pathogen represented by this bacteria here. Complement protein C3B then approaches the bacteria and binds to its surface. This is helpful because as we discussed before, phagocytes have a binding site for C3B on their surface called CR1. The reason this promotes phagocytosis is because with this binding site complement protein pair, it is easier for the phagocyte to envelop the bacterium and digest it within it. And that is how the process of opsonization promotes phagocytosis.